بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله نعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين رحمة للعالمين مولانا وسيدنا ابي القاسم محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين المظلومين الهداة المهديين لا سيما بقية الله في الارض ارواحنا له الفداء ولعنة الله على اعدائه مجمعين من الان الى قيام يوم الدين اما بعد فقد قال امير المؤمنين علي بن ابي طالب عليه السلام اللهم صل على محمد وان قوما عبد الله شكرا فتلك عباده الاحرار بر محمد وال محمد صلوات respected elders brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh we've reached the fourth lecture in our series of understanding the deeper wisdoms behind our acts of worship and this links to our topic of last year in which we discussed the journey of the soul or the stages of the soul we cannot hope to progress towards allah in our soul we cannot hope to have a meaningful life on this earth we cannot hope to have a successful life in the hereafter if we do not come to this point and realize that it requires hard work there's no quick fix there's no instant tablet or pill that you can take to make you into a successful person in this life and the hereafter it requires hard work and this hard work comes in the form of worship acts of worship ibadat and each ibadat has got a secret behind it and each secret has been explained by the 14 masumin but not always in the same way so you'll often find that they will explain certain secrets at certain times to certain people they won't reveal everything at once This has a number of reasons. Maybe the person who is listening can't take it. His heart is not ready for it yet. Maybe the imam saw some wisdom in not explaining everything. But that presents us with a slight problem, which is why we need to think carefully about this subject. The problem is that sometimes we can take an intermediary level of explanation and we can mistakenly think that it is the ultimate objective let me give you an example commonly when we are asked by non muslims about fasting they say to us why do you fast so a common answer is we fast in order to feel the pain of hunger which the poor people feel right that's fine masumin have already, also said this imams have also said this but then there's a question that comes to mind isn't it what about the poor muslim who is fasting he is already knows what it feels like so why does he have to fast so that's what we would say is an intermediate level objective it's not the full picture it's not the true ultimate essence of the fast it's one of the aspects of the fast what we want to do is we want to discuss each and every act of worship in a way that we can understand all the different levels intermediate and the ultimate so yesterday we were discussing that everything in this universe has a hidden aspect it's not always obvious and it's our job to find out what that hidden aspect is because we can become very bored of ibadat we can become very tired sometimes we don't feel like doing it one of the reasons behind that is that we have not understood it properly 
We have not understood the deeper aspect and wisdom in it. If we had understood it, our heart would have been more eager and keen to participate in that ibadat. But as we go through life and as we mature in terms of our soul, in terms of our spirituality, it's like a child in school. A child in school will learn English. Someone who is doing a PhD in the English language will also learn English. But you can't compare the two. At an entry level, we will think of things in a very simple way. But as we become cleverer and cleverer in our soul and stronger spiritually, we will understand things in a more developed, sophisticated way. We start to become really sophisticated in the way we understand things. So the way I would like us to start to think about our worship is in three categories. Number one, we have the ahkam of ibadat. We have the laws of ibadat. That tells us what is wajib and what is haram. Then we have the mustahab things in ibadat, which we would call the adab. What are the etiquettes of ibadat? The mustahab things, putting on fragrance before praying, new clean clothes, white clothes, doing certain things and then we pray, it has more sawab, these are mustahab things. But then beyond that we have a third category, which we will call hikmat or wisdom of the worship. What is the wisdom behind this act? Now the reason why I want to emphasize wisdom so much is because the physical act will remain in this world only. When we go to the next life, Barzakh, and then again into Qiyamat or Akhirat, the physical manifestation of our deeds will not be there. We won't be reciting namaz there. We won't be keeping roza there. We've already kept them here in a physical sense. We will then experience it there in a spiritual sense. So if we want our ahkam and our ibadat to transfer over there, it has to have a level of hikmat and wisdom. If it doesn't have hikmat and wisdom, then over there we will be given a very simple reward or a very simple result. Because we've understood it simply. If we understand it deeply, philosophically, in a very mature way, then we will get the result over there. Because it is the world of maturity and sophistication. This is not the world of maturity and sophistication. This is the world of three dimensions and physical objects. That's why we have to do things here physically. So, what will ultimately happen is that your level of nafs, your level of soul will determine how much you take from each ibadat. If I'm someone who is completely consumed with my own greed and selfishness, then all I will take from my ibadat is what I want from Allah. I will constantly see my ibadat as like a shopping list of duas. I want this, I want this, I want this. The only time I refer to manuals is when I'm in a difficult situation. What does Mafati say about tangi in rizq? I feel poor these days. I've not got a good income. Let me open Mafati. What does it say about this? My father is ill. What does Mafati say about having a good health? And all the problems of life, we think it's a shopping list to open Mafati and Quran, take something from it, and that will solve our problems. That's not why Ibadat was made at all. Ibadat itself, the word Ibadat, actually means servanthood. It is to show God how much of a servant you are. It's not to take from God your wishes. That's a byproduct. That's a bonus that Allah gives us. That's from His mercy. Otherwise, ibadat is actually to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how worshipful we are. One quick story from the life of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam It's narrated that Rasulullah was one day sitting on, in the streets of Medina as he usually would He would hold audiences, he would receive people He was sitting there 
and a lady approaches him, she says, Ya Rasulullah, I love everything about you except for one thing. He says, Tell me, what is this one thing? She says, Tajlisu jilsat al abd. The way you sit, it's like our servants sit like this. You sit so humbly, so meekly, weakly. You know, you, you sit like a servant. This is how our servants sit. Rasulullah says, وَوَيْحَكِي فَأَيُّ عَبْدٍ أَعَبَدُ minni." He says, woe be to you. You have not understood. Which servant is there more dutiful to his master than me? I see myself all the time in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why I sit like this all the time. Because I'm always aware that I'm a servant of Allah. So, ibadat must be understood properly. It must be understood for what it is. It is the chance for us to show Allah how much of His servants we are. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Oh. So yesterday we discussed intention. That is the cornerstone. Ulama say intention to an act is like soul to a body. Take a body, take a person. The moment you extract that soul, that body will fall down and crumble. It won't have an ounce of life in it. Within a few hours it will begin to stink. It will become infested. You'll have to stay away from it. You'll find it disgusting. An act without intention is like this. It is like a body without a soul. It will not benefit anyone. Because it must have that ingredient of intention. In the words of Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam. He says that a good intention is that intention in which you do not expect any praise or appreciation from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now here we have two traps of shaitan which we tend to fall into. The first trap of shaitan is that we do something, we do a good deed, we help someone and then we complain. We say things like, I did this for him but he did not even thank me. They did not even appreciate me. Ulama say that this comes into this category. If you think you are doing something for someone and then you expect to be thanked for it, it's not sincere. Because the act which is supposed to be sincere, a good intention is that in which you do not expect appreciation from anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first trap of shaitan. The second trap. The second trap of shaitan is very cunning indeed. What he does is that in the moment of sincerity, we will do a good deed and we will be sincere about this good deed. We perform the deed, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us sawab. Let's say he gives us a thousand sawab for example's sake. After the deed is done, every time you go and tell someone about this deed, I did this, I did this, I did this, even in passing, even by the by, even in conversation, even just dropping it in there as something insignificant, part of that sawab is removed. So a thousand becomes nine hundred, becomes seven hundred, becomes 200, becomes zero. And people will be there on the Day of Judgment and they will say to Allah, this cannot be my A'amal. I did much more than this, O oh my Lord. He'll say, yes, you did. And then you burnt it by telling other people. These are the two traps of shaitan we must be very aware of. Once you do something, this is what the ulama advise. Once you do something, then forget about it. Pretend you didn't do it. Just forget about it. Take it out of your mind. Once you forget about it, there's no chance of mentioning it to anyone else. Just put it out of your mind. Pretend you didn't do it. Then you'll be looking forward to the next occasion when you can repeat that good deed, inshallah. So, niyat, 
encourages us to be pure in our action. It forces us to act. Because when you have a good intention, that will build and it builds momentum. And you want to do more as a result of that intention. But the niyat has levels. As we said yesterday, Amir al Mu'mineen, Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam says, Allah has said. There are three types of people. One group will worship Allah, greedy for what He can give them. These are the businessmen. Another group are fearful of what He will punish them with. These are the slaves. And a third group worships Allah because of a sense of gratitude. And this is the worship of the free people. The truly free, the ahrar. Now, this is moving us towards understanding ikhlas. Sincerity. The opposite of sincerity is what I want to speak about. The opposite of sincerity is called riya. Doing things to show, to show others. So you do something in order for other people to look at you and say, Wow, what a person, what a man, excellent, what a good deed. This is known as riya. Someone came to Ayatollah Bahajat Marhum. May Allah raise his station. They came to Ayatollah Bahajat and they said, Agha, we are afflicted by Riya. I cannot help but do Riya. How do I stop this? Agha said, continue doing Riya. But not for human beings, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Show off as much as you want to Allah. Show him how good you are. Get him to say, mashallah. Get him to say, wow. Get him to say, fantastic. Keep doing it, but show it to Allah, not to people. Riya is that thing that slowly eats at the soul of a person. And it will remove that ikhlas of the niyat. And it will remove that action itself. It will nullify it. So, the way I want to summarize it for you, in a practical sense is this before your day begins in the morning before you do your main activities of the day take a time out a minute two minutes 30 seconds if you want just sit and contemplate reflect what am I going to do today what is my plan everyone knows a rough idea of the day who am I going to meet what work will I do? What work will I achieve? How much of this can I do strictly for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Take a time out. Probe in your mind. Reflect. Think. And find that time to devote your acts for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can do the same thing before every prayer. You can do the same thing before dua. You can do the same thing before any act of worship. Take that time, think carefully, and then go towards that act of worship. Make sure it is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why you'll see many ulama, they will take that few seconds before they say takbiratul ihram. If you are fortunate in, to pray behind them, you'll see that they don't, don't uh, begin their act of worship straight away. They have that moment of reflection of clarity, of what I'm doing, who I'm facing. And that's when they begin their prayers with one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We move on to the subject now of purification. Purification, or in Islamic terms, taharat, is something that exists in every single religion. You'll see all major religions have this concept. Some kind of cleansing, washing. Um, in Christianity, you have baptism. Uh, in the Hindu faith, you have the form that they do in the sacred rivers which they believe in. There's some kind of bathing, ritual, cleansing, which has a dual effect. There's a physical act, but it represents something much greater. In short, what Islam says is that whatever keeps a person away from God must be cleansed. So in a nutshell, 
cleansing within Islam, whether it's wuzu, ghusl, tayammum, all of these different ways of purification, cleansing, are all geared towards making us understand that there are certain things which we must cleanse ourselves from, which are keeping us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must have that clarity of purpose to understand our goal and what is preventing us from that goal. Now, for someone, it may be love of family that may be preventing them from reaching Allah. Love of money, wealth, their job, their luxuries, their possessions, their house, their car. It could be anything, but what is keeping them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's what we have to identify. Let me tell you a story about Nabi Isa with one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In most of our lives, what keeps us away from Allah are the luxuries and the wealth. In Hazrat Isa's life, we find this story. This is really interesting. Hazrat Isa was famous for being an aesthetic. He really had nothing to do with the world in a luxurious sense. But his practice was that he used to sleep at night with his head resting on a rock. Right? You can't get more simpler than that, can you? For someone to sleep at night without really a house or a bed or a blanket or anything, with one salawat, please Allah Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. You can't get more simpler than that. So, what happened is, over time, Hazrat Isa began to find an attachment towards this rock. Now, it sounds strange, but because he had become so used to it, because he had made it a routine for himself, because he enjoyed the aesthetic nature of the rock, Shaitan comes to him and says, Ya Isa, araghibta fid dunya. Have you become attracted to the world? Isa said, No, look at me. I am so simple. And Shaitan said, No, can you bear to be without that rock of yours every night? So what does he do? He realizes at that moment and he throws it away. Even the most basic thing can become an attachment. And the more attachments you have, the less you'll be able to let go and travel towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another story. Mullah Ahmad Naraqi Marhum, one of the famous ulama of Islam, written many books on akhlaq. It so happened that in his life, he was wealthy. He had wealth. He was visited one day by a common person who was traveling through on his way to Najaf, he passed through the village of Mullah Naraqi and he sees his house, he meets him and he says, My God, I did not realize you were so wealthy. You have a house, you have land, you have animals, you have things growing. This is wealth. So Mullah Naraqi explains to him, Yes, these are my things. I acquired them lawfully. I give from them to charity. But it's not important what you own. The important thing is that that thing should not own you. So they have this debate and Mullah Naraki fails to convince him. So this person comes and he says, look, I'm on my way to Najaf. Why don't you come with me? We'll, we'll continue our discussion. Mullah Naraki says, okay, I'll come with you. They start to go towards Najaf. Now it so happened that this simple man, he had a, what you would call like a container, a very simple clay pot in which he used to keep a few things and he would keep it inside his pocket. So after they had gone a couple of miles, that man put his hand inside, to, inside his pocket to take out this clay pot, this container. And he sees, oh, my thing has, is not here, where could it be? So he remembers and he says, oh, I removed it at your house and I've left it there. You know, the panic when we feel our mobile phone is not in our pocket, how we panic. 
So he said, oh, I must have removed it at your house. I must have left it there. Come on, let's go back and get it. So Mullah Naraki says, we've traveled miles. And you want us to go all the way back for this thing? He goes, yes, yes, it's very important for me. So he says to him, now you tell me. I left my house, land, animals in an instant when you said come for the ziyarat of Najaf. You claiming that you are so simple cannot bear to be without this one possession of yours which is not even worth anything. So now you tell me, who is more worldly from the two? And then it hit him, exactly what Mullah Naraki was trying to say. So in the language of Islam, attachments are bad. Any attachment, apart from godly attachments. So someone says, I'm attached to Imam Hussein alayhi salam, that's fine. That's a godly attachment. I'm attached to Quran, that's fine. But other attachments which keep you away from Allah are not good. So, in terms of purification, we must cleanse ourselves from everything that keeps us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, what the Quran says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu idha qumtum ila salah. In the famous verse describing wudu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, you who believe when you go towards namaz, when you go and stand before God to pray, you must do certain things. You must wash your faces, you must wash your arms, you must wipe your head, you must wipe your feet. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you can't find water, you can do tayammu with clean earth. After this, he makes a conclusion. He says, مَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيَجْعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ حَرَجْ Allah is telling you to do things, not because He wants you to have any difficulty. وَلَكِنْ يُرِيدُ لِيُطَّهِرَكُمْ He wants you to become pure. Wudu and tayammum are there to purify us. Now, the question arises, that when we say wudu purifies us, it's quite simple. Water, being a cleansing agent, will naturally clean a person. Put it on your face, put it on your arms, you're going to be cleaner than before. Any dust, dirt on your body will be washed off. What about the yammum? The yammum literally is making yourself dirtier than you were before. Because you have to wipe on your face and back of the hands dust. You could be the most clean person physically, but after tayammum you will have a layer of dust. So how do we equate that? Well, when we say purity, we mean inner purity. Water may give external purity, but tayammum doesn't. So we understand now that when Allah says, I wish to purify you with these things, it is an inner purity that He's talking about. When we go towards wudu, we should have a certain attitude. When we go towards tayammum, we should have a certain attitude. What attitude? Imam Khomeini, he says, and he used to say this regularly in his life, whenever he would approach wudu, he would say, and he would say this sentence, he would say, let us go towards the mercy of Allah. That was his attitude. That was his mindset. That that is a point for me to access the mercy of God. When we read other works of other ulama, for example, Ayatullah Qara'ati, a current day a contemporary scholar, he says, when you see the wudu coming out of the tap, you're ready to do your wuzu and you, you see the water come out of the tap. You should think to yourself about water itself and how one can become like water and adopt the properties of water. Water is what? It's soft. It can penetrate into everything. It purifies. It cleanses. Are we the type of people that we can mix with others and cleanse them and purify them. Or are we, naudhu billah, God forbid, are we polluters? When we go into a gathering, do we add value? 
or do we take value away? Do we promote that gathering or do we pollute that gathering? He says, be like water, be soft, be kind, be considerate. He says, purify other things. And he says, build yourself into such a capacity. You become so great in your heart, just like a large pool of water, as you know from Ahkam, from Fiqh, when there is Kur water and Najasat falls in, the whole thing doesn't become Najis. Only that part in which the color, taste or smell has changed becomes Najis. He says, become like that Kur water. Make your heart so big. In Farsi, we call it Darya Dili. Darya Dili. Like an ocean, like a river. Your heart becomes so massive. It becomes so um, spiritually enlarged that anything that happens inside that heart, it can take it. It can encompass it. It can cover it. So, water, tayammum, are to purify us within. Now, what about tayammum? Think about the effect of tayammum. What we understand from tayammum is that we are covering ourselves with dirt for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should bring inside us a feeling of humility. That we are nothing. That we are from dirt. We will go towards dirt. All day we clean ourselves and our houses to get rid of dirt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, have a reminder that there are certain times that will come in your life, you'll have to return back to dirt. So make yourself humble. Make yourself humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We have the following hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He says, when you go towards wudu, then say the following. When you are about to wash your face, say, Oh Allah, whatever, I have, whatever sins I have committed with this face, I wash them away. So I can worship you with a face that is pure. And I can do a sajda with a forehead that is pure. When you wash your hands, say to God, O oh Allah, I have washed my hands of sins. I don't want to go back to sins. Whatever sins I've done with these hands, I wash away. When you wipe your head, say to God, O oh Allah, every wrong thought that I've ever had, I am cleaning away and I'm wiping away with your feet. Tell Allah, forgive me, O oh my Lord, for the sins that I've done with these feet, for the places that I've gone to where I should not have gone. Over time, when a person has this kind of attitude towards wudu and tayammum and ghusl, he will develop a kind of shield around him. That shield is known as taqwa. Because that now protects him from sin. And then we have this following hadith from Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi salatu wassalam. Al-mu'minu. لا ينجسه شيء مؤمن is that person which nothing can make him najis meaning inside he will not allow pride and arrogance to make him dirty on the inside he will not allow jealousy and anger to make him dirty on the inside he will not allow anything to influence him in a negative way Finally, we have the following advice from our ulama. Ayatollah Mar'ashi Marhum used to say this to his students. He says, if you are seeking divine success and tawfiq in your life for spiritual things and for your normal practical daily life, then I advise you three things. Number one, always be in the state of wudu. It illuminates the heart, it removes sadness. One of the qualities of wudu is that it takes away gham from a person. You know that feeling of grief, that feeling of being down, that feeling of suffering. Wudu takes that away from qalbe insan, from the heart of a person. So number one, always be in the state of wudu. Number two, Wherever you can, escort janaza, funeral, 
dead body, mayat. Whenever you can, escort it, even if it is for a few steps. Why? What our sixth Imam says is when you are part of a janazah, when you are accompanying the, the funeral, just stop for a second and think in your mind, it is me inside that coffin. Just for a second. Think that thought in your mind, that it is me in there right now. And then when you come back to yourself and when your thought returns, you will realize how lucky you are that Allah is still giving you an opportunity to repent and to change and to walk upon His path. So number two, accompany the janazah as much as possible, even if for a few steps. Number three, participate in the majalis of Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. That is also one of the great sources of divine tawfiq and grace. Sometimes we don't have tawfiq. There's a reason behind it. Sins, for example, are a barrier to tawfiq. Na shukri, not being, uh, not having gratitude towards Allah, is a barrier for tawfiq. Cutting sile rahm, cut a rahm. Cutting off with family ties, not speaking to them, not visiting them, not asking about them. These are all barriers to tawfiq. Missing prayers is another one. These are all things which are a barrier. They block tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the three of these were, be in wudu as much as possible. Number two, accompany funerals as much as possible, even if it is for a few steps. And number three, participate in the azar of our third Imam with one salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In this same piece of advice, Ayatollah Marashi continues, he says, despite being one of the senior figures and ulama of the Hawza, I would take pride and pleasure in serving tabarruk and tea to the azadar of Imam Hussein. It was a pleasure and a pride for him to do this. There's no barrier. There's no sense of big and small when it comes to Imam Hussain al It is tawfiq which is the big thing. Tonight, I want to cover a period of history regarding the third Imam, which will show us this very nicely. The issue of tawfiq. Imam Hussain receives the news of the Shahadat of Hazrat Muslim. He is very, very upset and grieved by this news. He continues on his plan. He cannot go back to Makkah. Medina is out of the question. The only place he can really go to is to continue towards Kufa. He begins his journey. Now, he reaches a place which was known as the station of Bani Muqatil. So in the desert they used to have lots of stations and these were mainly water wells where travelers would stop, they would fill their skins of water, their jugs of water, they would feed their animals and they would continue. Now when he reaches this place, he sees that there is a tent there. The tent has a sword, has a spear and has a horse. He realizes that someone special is here, like that were the, those were the signs of someone big, a leader. He asks, Liman Hard al Fustat, whose tent is this? They tell him, Ya Aba Abdullah, this is the tent of Ubaidullah ibn Hur al Juhafi. He recognizes the name. Ubaidullah al Juhafi was a great warrior, poet, scholar of Kufa. He sends his companion, Hajjaj. He says, Hajjaj, go to Ubaidullah. Tell him Hussein asks for his support and bring me his jawab. Hajjaj goes, he speaks to Ubaidullah. He says, Ubaidullah, I am here, I have brought you a message. Ubaidullah asks him, Wa ma wara'uk? 
What is that I can see behind you? Hajjaj answers, Allahu Warahi. Allah is behind me. Meaning Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Meaning the man of God. A man who represents Allah. And he says, he's asking for your support. Hajjaj says, tell him I'm sorry. I cannot give my support. You see Tawfiq. Hajjaj says, tell him sorry, I cannot give my support. Hajjaj goes back. Ubaidullah says, I cannot give my support. Hajjaj goes back, conveys the message. Imam Hussein, being so humble, stands up himself and says, I will go and see Ubaidullah. Imam Hussein leaves his tent, goes towards the tent of Ubaidullah. Ubaidullah sees him from a distance. He is shocked that the son of Fatima is giving me this much respect that he's standing up and coming towards me. He goes out of his tent, they meet in the middle, they say salam to one another, they exchange formalities. And Imam says, I invite you to join me. Ubaidullah says, Oh Imam, I was scared of you coming to Kufa and asking me to join you. That's why I've left Kufa and come here. I have a wife, I have children, I have commitments. Do you see attachments? Do you see how they can hinder a person? I have a wife, I have children, I have commitments. I cannot join you. If you had more supporters, I would have been the first one. If you had more people with you, I would have been the first one with you. But in this situation, I cannot. But I will give you my horse. I'll give you my sword. My horse is loyal. My sword has never lost a battle. Imam says, I've not come for your horse or for your sword. I've come for you. I am here for humanity. I'm here to break the shackles that people have with their attachments. I've come for you. Ubaidullah refuses. He goes his way. Imam comes back. They continue the journey. When Ibn Ziyad finds out that Hussein is still on his way to Kufa, he makes a plan. He says, I don't want Hussein to reach Kufa. So he sends Hur with 1,000 men, because they didn't know accurately, they don't know, is Hussein coming with a big army, small army? What's the state of Hussein? So he sends janab hur and he says, go and stop him. Do not let him reach Kufa. Stop him and send him into a place where there is no vegetation and there is no water, there is no shade, and keep him there. As Hur leaves Kufa, he hears a voice, a voice of ghaib, a hidden announcement. The voice says to him, Ya Hur, anta ala al-khayr. You are on goodness. Now do you see Tawfiq? Hur is going to stop Imam Hussein. But he hears the voice saying, you are going for a good thing. He is confused. He doesn't understand. He goes and what happens is the two parties see each other from a distance. Imam Hussein's group and Janabi Hur's group. They see each other. And they see that in the middle there is a hill. And they're not sure are these people hostile or not. Both camps are thinking the same thing. Are they coming to attack us or not? So they both begin to run and to gallop to reach the hill first. Because if you're on the hill, you have an elevated position, you have an advantage if there's a fight. It so happens that Imam and his group reaches the hill first. And Hor's group reaches second. Hor's group, when they reach, they're tired, they're sweating, they're panting. Imam Hussein, this beacon of humanity, this beacon of generosity, he orders Hazrat Abbas, he says, give them all water. They all drank. He says, give their horses water. The horses drank. 
He says, give their camels water. Their camels drank. These were the same people, after four or five days, they will deny Hussein water in Karbala. Hussein feeds them all at this place. Imam Hussein looks at Hur and says, O oh Hur, Anta alayka am ma'ana. Are you with us or are you against us? Hur says, Alayka, Ya Rasul, Ya Yabna Rasulillah. I'm against you, O oh son of the Prophet of Allah. Imam says, We are not here to bother you. We have no fight with you. Let us go on our way. Hur says, My orders are to force you into the plains of Karbala. Imam says, Death will be easier for you than to do this to us. There is a little bit of aggression at this point. Swords are taken out, spears are put into the direction of the Ahlul Bayt and Imam Hussein. Hur, from history, what we understand is that Hur did not think it would go to the stage of Ashura. It seems Hur was of the mindset that I will keep him here for a time, there will be some kind of conciliation and agreement, and then people will go on their way. My job is just to keep him here for a short time. So Hur says, I have my orders, I cannot allow you to go. Imam Hussein decides that that is not the moment of fight, to fight him, and he goes into the desert. When he enters the desert of Karbala, he asks, what is this place? He is told, Ya Aba Abdullah, this place is known by many names. One of those names is Qaziriya. He says, no, tell me another name. They say, another name of this place is Shattul Furat. He says, no, tell me another name. They say, another name is Nainawa. He says, no, call me one of the elders from this place. An elder of Bani Asad comes. The Bani Asad was the tribe who lived around Karbala. He says, is there another name of this place? He says, Yabna Rasulillah, if you don't ask me, it is better. Imam says, tell me. He says, this place is also known as Karbin wa Bala, a place of sorrow and calamity. Imam gets down from his horse and says, this is where we will put our tents. This is where we will stay. This is where our blood will be spilled. This is where our children will become shaheed. We have a reference to this in history. When Imam Ali salam was going towards Siffin for the battle with Muawiyah, it is said that he passed through Karbala. And when he passed through Karbala, he stood there and he began to weep and he wept so much. Ibn Abbas narrates, that I saw Amirul Mu'mineen weeping to such an extent that I asked him, I said, Oh Mawla, why do you weep so much? And all he could say was, Sabran Ya Aba Abdullah. Oh Aba Abdullah, have supper at this place. Have supper at this place. Imam puts up his tents. They begin to prepare to stay in this place. Imam is staying in Karbala now. He realizes that now this is the place that he has been promised by his grandfather, by his father, that he is to give a sacrifice for Islam which no one had given before him. And on that morning of Ashura, we see the tawfiq which happens to janab Hur. It is said, that if you were to choose a person in the army of Yazid, who was the bravest and most courageous and most noble, that would be Hur. And Hur on the morning of Ashura is seen, his face is pale, he has not slept the whole night, 
and he is walking up and down. Someone comes to him and says, Oh Hur, you look as if you are scared. What is the matter? Hur says, Do me a favor, put your ear to the wind and tell me what do you hear? When the man puts his ear to the wind, he looks at Hur and he says, All I can hear are the screams of children and they seem to be screaming, Alatash, Alatash, Alatash. We are thirsty, we are thirsty. Hur says, This is the reason that I cannot find any rest in my heart and I must go towards Hussein. And Hur says to his son, You come along along with me and he says to his servant you come along with me but I cannot go before Hussein like this Hur says first of all tie my hands behind my back and tie a blindfold around my eyes and you lead me to Hussein and when Hur comes close to the camp of Imam Hussein Imam says to Ali Akbar Ali Akbar go and receive the son of Hur and he tells Abbas, he says, Oh Abbas, go and receive the brother of Hur. And they say to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, Ya Aba Abdullah, who will you receive? He says, I will receive the slave of Hur who has come with him. This was the Imam, this was the humility of Hussein. Hur comes before Imam, he falls at his feet and he says, Oh Hussein, Oh Aba Abdullah. Because of me, you are now in this situation. I was forced to lead you here. Can you forgive me? Imam says, Hur, do you not know who we are? We are Kareem, Ibn al Kareem. We are kind. Our father and mother were kind. We have forgiven you. Hur says, Before I can take your leave, may I request to be presented in the company of Janab Zainab? Can I ask her for forgiveness? Who comes to Janab Zainab and he falls again at the feet and he says, Baby, do you have the courage to forgive me? She says, Hor, stand up. You are our guest. You are forgiven. He says, Oh, great lady, promise me one thing that on the day of judgment, when your mother Fatima comes, that you will not complain about me. She says, Hor, you are forgiven. Now stand, Hor and his son come to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. They say, Oh Abba Abdullah, give us the honor. Give us the honor to go and fight and defend you. We want to give our lives. Imam Hussein says, Go, go and achieve your martyrdom. Janab Hur and his son go out and they fight and they fight and they make sure they cause a lot of casualties in the army of, of Umar Saad. But slowly and surely, this father and son they become separated. Hur finds himself on one side. His son is on another side. And slowly, as the fatigue and the tiredness hits them, it is his son who first of all is struck down. And when the son is struck down, the son begins to shout to his father, Adrikni ya abata. Oh father, come to me. Janabe Hur, like any father would do, drops everything and begins to run towards his son. Before he runs towards his son, Imam Hussein meets him in the middle and he hugs him, he carries him, he supports him. Janabi Hur says, Oh Abba Abdullah, what are you doing? Imam says, Hur, no father should have to go to receive the body of his son alone. I am here to protect you. Oh Abba Abdullah, what happened when Ali Akbar fell? Who came with you to the body of Ali Akbar? They say that when when Ali Akbar was on the ground, Imam could not walk in a straight line. Imam would walk and then he would fall and then he would walk and then he would fall and he had darkness in front of his eyes and every time he would fall, he would say, Aina, Aina, Ya Ali Akbar, Ali Akbar, where are you? I cannot see you. Imam, you were kind. You went with Hur, but no one was there to come with our Imam to the body of Ali Akbar, Allah, 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 Allah,
wasaya laman ladina zalamu ayyaman kalibiyan kalibun let us remember all our marhumin with al-fatiha